Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I am rising on behalf of my party to strongly oppose the government of the National Capital Territory of Delhi, Amendment Bill 2023. Let me make it clear at the outset that this bill is no ordinary piece of legislation. It represents a grave chapter in the history of the Indian Republic, seeking to ratify an ordinance that in many ways is an assault on our democratic heritage and the spirit of federalism. During the introduction of the bill itself, sir, I had filed a motion strongly opposing its very introduction in this House at a time when a motion of no confidence is pending for discussion. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita of Parliamentary Practice and Procedure, call in Shakhtar, page 772, explicitly states, when the leave of the House to the moving of a motion of no confidence has been granted, no substantive motion on policy matters is to be brought before the House by the government till the motion of no confidence is disposed of. Sir, in 27 no confidence motions brought since independence to this House, no bills were debated and passed before this government did so with two bills in 2018. Therefore, such an improper introduction of a substantive policy change while a no confidence motion is pending is against democratic morality, to use a word much favored by the Treasury benches. Let me remind my colleagues in this House that it was almost four years ago exactly when this government unceremoniously passed a bill that sealed the fate of a state government practically overnight in the rampant disregard for the basic constitutional relationship of the people of Jammu and Kashmir to the Republic of India without consulting them or their elected representatives, this government showcased the same attitude that we are seeing today. A breathtaking betrayal of our democratic political traditions, culture, and utter contempt for the people of the state and of the value of the political representation that these citizens of India give themselves through elections. Four years later, we're back in the House with a government that is clearly bringing the same attitude, same attitude to our national capital. We saw when the Home Minister spoke. Sir, I'm sorry, I'm not yielding. Sir. I'm not yielding. I'm not yielding. Sir. No. This is my right. Listen. No, no. It is yield or not. This is my right. Yes, it is right of the House. 352-1. 52-1. अभी इन्होंने जम्मू कश्मीर के बारे में कहा सर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल बेंच सुप्रीम कोर्ट का उसको रोज सुन रहा है और उसके बारे में इन्होंने बिना कुछ कहे हुए अपना एक्सप्लेनेशन दे दिया सर आई राइट टू समथिंग दैट हैपेंड इन दिस हाउस 4 इयर्स अगो ओके ओके बोलिए सर रिडिकुलस पॉइंट ऑफ ऑर्डर सर जी नाउ द होम मिनिस्टर इन इंट्रोड्यूसिंग दिस बिल अटेम्प्टेड टू इनवोक नेहरू जी in his support and i think that the expression that my friend anandi maran was quoting in tamil was that the devil can quote scripture for his own purposes the truth is that times change sir times change and with that facts change as well there were no elected representatives for delhi in an assembly in those days sir we were talking about a different delhi and we were talking about a different india today 75 years have happened since independence 76 in any case I have to say to my dear friends in the Treasury benches, you oppose everything Nehru said, you oppose everything Nehru stood for, so why not this one too? Oppose him saying that, uh, opposing, oppose him saying that Delhi should be under the central government, that will be the end of the conversation. They also went on about alliance politics, but let me stress, Mr. Chairman, this is not about alliance politics, this is about a principle. And the principle is that the Democratic and Federal Republic of India finds a grave shadow cast upon it today, sir. The Union of States, so original and aspirational in its genesis, faces a crisis of the federal division of powers. We saw the Minister of State for External Affairs choosing to intervene on internal affairs. Fine, that's your party's prerogative. But the fact is that she asserted that India is not federal. She said it three times. Why then do we have a state list, a concurrent list, a union list? Because we are federal. I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm not yielding. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm responding to a debate, to a point made in a debate. I have every right to do so, sir. Why does the government and the Prime Minister speak of cooperative federalism if she is right and we are not federal? Obviously, the government wants to have seen the virtues of cooperative federalism, but in stark contrast to that, we see the ruling party impinging upon the sovereign domain of the states from vacillating on GST dues and Munrega payments to states 
to bulldozing through laws and subjects from the state list. A blatant subversion of the constitutional separation of powers is taking place again today through this bill. The difference is at this time around, the Honorable Supreme Court was loud, clear, and unequivocal. And the government seems determined to ignore it. Let me set out before the House the three dangerous prongs of this amendment, sir. It removes services from the legislative competence of the Delhi Legislative Assembly. In other words, it amends the Constitution without being a, constituent assembly, uh, a constitutional amendment bill. Second, it establishes this National Capital Civil Services Authority, consisting, as everyone has pointed out, of the Chief Minister, Chief Secretary, Principal Home Secretary. Now, the authority in which the elected CM can be outvoted by the other two can even convene on the basis of quorum of two. So even without the CM, the two officials can get together and decide anything they like, sir. They can make then recommendations to the Lieutenant Governor regarding transfers, postings, officials, of officials, disciplinary matters, and bureaucrats are going to henceforth exercise authority that voters have given to their elected public representatives. If BJP was in power in Delhi, sir, would they have accepted this? It seems a case of where you stand depends on where you sit. Now, third point, sir. The bill empowers the, the Lieutenant Governor to exercise his sole discretion on several matters, including those related to this uh, civil services, the summoning, prorogation, and dissolution of the Delhi Legislative Assembly. So this implies that the elected chief minister may even be unable to convene a session needed for essential government business. The LG can overrule him. Even a unanimous decision of this authority can be overruled by the LG. He can define the powers and duties of the officers of the Delhi government, superseding the minister. <coughs> now, sir, executive lawmaking through an ordinance, as the Supreme Court held in D.C. Wadhwa 1987, is only to meet an extraordinary situation and cannot be perverted to serve, serve political ends, quote unquote, from the Supreme Court. But the government, the government's arguments even today were all political, sir. And what is interesting is it has intervened on political grounds in a brazen manner. Most crucially, they have added this subject of the exemption of services to the existing exemptions in the Constitution, land, public order, and police, under Article 239 AA, which everyone has been citing. To do it without amending the Constitution, which requires a two-thirds majority and a different process, is an act of constitutional subterfuge. Now, how ironic that when the Supreme Court has said that there is a complete breakdown of, a breakdown of constitutional machinery in Manipur, you don't want to discuss it. But when you want, you want to amend the constitutional machinery when it is functioning in working order in Delhi without admitting it. What kind of contradiction this is there? Now, is an ordinance or a bill even constitutionally permissible when the very framework of the constitution's basic structure is being altered? Article 239 AA provides the Delhi uh, Legislative Assembly with powers to make laws on subjects in the state list and the concurrent list, barring police, public order, and land. Agreed. Parliament, of course, their rights can legislate on subjects under the state list with respect to Delhi, but the, be the bill specifies that the Delhi Legislative Assembly will not have the power to legislate on the subject of services, which actually comes under the state list. So by doing so, the bill effectively expands the subjects that the Delhi Assembly cannot legislate on and therefore is changing the constitutional framework. Under Article 368 of the Constitution, a constitutional amendment has to be initiated for such an action. So I ask you, Mr. Chairman, sir, how can you admit this bill except under the rubric of a constitutional amendment bill? It just seems to me, sir, this is completely out of order okay. in terms of the procedures of this House. Now let me take you back to what the Court has said in its judgment of May 2023. The Supreme Court has argued that democratic government rests on a triple chain of accountability. Civil servants are accountable to ministers, ministers are accountable to legislators, and legislatures are accountable to the electorate. That is how we all function, sir, that's our democracy. If a democratically elected government is not provided with the power to control the officers posted within its own domain, then this key principle of the triple chain of collective responsibility becomes redundant, sir. By severing the first link of the triple chain of accountability, the bill is essentially contradicting the principles of parliamentary democracy in the very year that the Prime Minister has hailed us as the mother of all democracy. Can a mother treat her children this way, sir? 
Now, I do want to say, sir, Article 239AA, which, huh? Stepmother. <laughs> no, I, even stepmothers would not do this, I assure you. Confer a special status on the National Capital Territory, constitutionally entrenched a representative form of government, and incorporated a spirit of federalism so that the residents of the capital of India have a say in how they are governed, sir. It is the responsibility of the government of the NCTD to give expression to the will no, of the please. people of Delhi who elected them, sir. Now, the Supreme Court has said that the Delhi has a sui generis status. They keep saying it's not a full state, but it has a special status. The court noted that the principles of federalism and democracy are interlinked since the state's exercise of legislative power gives effect to people's aspirations. And that federalism, I'm quoting the Supreme Court, creates dual manifestations of public will in which the priorities of the two sets of governments are not just bound to be different, but are intended to be different, quote, unquote. So what, is they, what are they talking about, sir, on the Treasury benches? Now, the Supreme Court's May judgment reiterates the principle spelt out by its 2018 judgment that ministers bear responsibility before the legislature for every action undertaken by public officials in their respective department. The court has observed a paramount feature of the federal constitution is this distribution of powers in such a way that the ministers ex exercise their exclusive power over administration. Now, how can you then say that a minister is responsible for an official who in fact can supersede him in this, and under the provisions of this bill. If you are a minister, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, and your official is taking a decision you don't approve of, how are you accountable? What happened to the core principle of parliamentary democracy, sir? And you cannot hold your officials accountable even for bureaucratic delays. They are larger than you, sir. They are, as, as Supriya Sule said, the selected are overtaking the elected. Now, the Lieutenant Governor under Article 239AA has to act on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers, except when exercising discretionary powers. Now, the Transaction of Business Rules of the Government of NCT Delhi, 1993, provides that certain matters must be submitted to the LG through the Chief Minister and Chief Secretary for his opinion prior to the issue of any order. And these are spelt out, sir. Peace and tranquility of Delhi, relations of the Delhi government with other state governments, uh, and uh, relations of the Delhi government with the Supreme Court, the High Court of Delhi, and summoning, proroguing, and dissolving of the Legislative Assembly. The bill expands those mentioned matters now to include the relations of the Delhi government with the central government. Additionally, it expands the powers of the Lieutenant Governor's opinion to have sole discretionary power on these matters. If there is any difference of opinion, even on matters beyond these three items, between the LG and the CM, the LG takes precedence. Now, this is the point that my respected colleague from the DMK was making, sir. Already in a time when there is a lot of controversy about the powers being exercised by governors in many states, we are now giving the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi an unprecedented degree of power over the elected representatives of the people who are supposed to implement the wishes of the public according even to the Supreme Court, sir. I'll, I'll conclude in two minutes, sir. The basic point is you all know Lieutenant governors and governors are supposed to act on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers on matters within their executive competence. So you're contradicting the 2018 judgment of the Supreme Court, which stated that the decision-making power lies with the elected government. How can this pass the filter of this hallowed house, sir? What we have repeatedly seen under this government is a brazen effort to curtail the autonomy of states. The PM talks about cooperative federalism, but we are witnessing instead coercive federalism, sir, that seeks to centralize all power in the hands of the central government. And the problem is, it looks as if in the new India, some states will, will come first if they're ruled by the right party. Others must remain subservient to the political wishes of those in Delhi. I want to conclude, sir, with just two more thoughts. The first is, there are multiple aspects to this bill. There's been the, I mean, to the, to the, not to the bill specifically, but to what the bill represents. The cultural aspect of assaults on states' rights by the unjustified push towards imposing Hindi on the southern states. There's a law and enforcement angle through the weaponization of independent regulatory and investigative bodies like the ED, the CBI, the IT department. There's also definitely the use of legislation like the Disaster Management Act. We saw 
an obscure provision of which was used to ride roughshod over states' rights in imposing successive lockdowns during COVID without consulting states. We've seen, sir, in the creation and misuse of the PM Cares Fund, which limited the flow of cash to the state-run chief minister's disaster relief funds. We've seen this with the acceleration of okay, centrally sponsored schemes, which now seeks conclude. to... Sir, I'm just illustrating the problem no, 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 of no, states' no. rights and federalism, sir. No. So I do want to say, and finally, the, finally the large number of cesses that are currently being levied by the okay. central government, the proceeds of which are not being shared with states, sir. So I, I'm sorry to say, is this a new definition of nakhaunga okay. nakhanidunga? I'm very, very concerned, sir, that this legislation is putting uniformity and central control over the democratic interests of our country Thank that you. the Prime Minister hails. And I do want to stress fundamentally, this is a basic constitutional question. The highest court of the land has ruled in favor of both the spirit Shri and the letter Hasran, of the Constitution. Sir, we owe ourselves more respect. Sir, Speaker Saab, bolte hai ki is ghar, is, is sabha ki garima ko respect karo, sir. We should definitely treat this house with more dignity than to let such a travesty of a bill pass this house. Thank sure. you, sir, and Jay.